The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And I invite you just to lay down your papers and let the word of the Lord fill your hearts and souls. As they walked along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they began again to ask the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and ask them, Is this your son, who you say was born born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've already told you and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sin. Are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The word of the Lord.
Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the blessing of the Spirit to anoint the Word. Come, Holy Spirit, and settle over us. Open our hearts to all these words that you bring to us, words that we hear and speak, sing and pray. May they be your words to us today, Lord. Amen. Parables, etc., tells a parable. It's not a true story, but it's a story meant to reveal a truth. The story is that three men went golfing together. One was a priest, one was a doctor, and one was an engineer. And as they golfed, they became increasingly irritated because the group in front of them were going so slowly. And they began to complain. They complained to one another profusely. And finally, they saw the greenskeeper across the way, and they decided to complain to him too. So they called him over, and they complained about how slow the group in front of them was going. To which the greenkeeper replied, that's a group of blind firefighters. They lost their sight last year when they came out to fight a fire in our clubhouse. And so from now on, we're going to let them play for free. Well, that, of course, silenced the complainers, at least for a time, until finally the priest said, oh, that's just terrible. I'll make special prayers for them tonight. And the doctor chimed in that he would ask an ophthalmologist friend if there was anything that could be done for them. Meanwhile, the engineer is still silent. And after a few moments, he says, well, in the meantime, can we not have them play at night? An uncomfortable laugh, isn't it? Uncomfortable because there's so much of it in the world, so much in which we look at the rest of the world without compassion. We don't see kindly into the lives of other people all the time. We look at them through the perspective of our own hurt and our own desires and our own selfish needs. And when we do that, we sometimes ignore the hurt in them and the way that life has been to them. I mean, how many people do you think ignore certain folks because they don't think their appearance means that they would know anything? They look at somebody's appearance and they think, that person can't do something. That person isn't smart enough to speak about this or that. How many times do you think people who've had a disagreement with someone forever after that cast their own shadow on the motives of that person without ever checking to see what those motives actually are? How many even of us ignore those who don't seem to look important? Well, that's exactly the setting for today's gospel into which Jesus speaks. Because in this gospel reading, we discern that Jesus responds differently to folks than many of us might. And the choices that he makes teach us much about the very nature of God. The first thing that we need to do as we look at this beautiful text is recognize a very important but seemingly simple thing, and that is that Jesus sees the blind man. Now, maybe that doesn't seem like anything much to say, but believe me, it is. How many people, maybe even most of the people, probably walked past that blind man day after day after day without ever really seeing him? without wanting to help him or get to know him or learn his story or care about him. They saw him more as a person to be avoided, someone to be away from. They didn't really care about him as a person. There's a credence for that in the text if you look at it because it explains why when he came back healed, they didn't really completely recognize him. Some of them thought it must actually be someone else. That means that they didn't really pay attention to him well enough to be able to recognize him when he comes back in a different setting, looking a little bit different than he had. It reveals that they also are blind. It's just a different kind of blindness. So there's a, Jesus looking and seeing this person means more than just physically to see. It is something profound happening here where Jesus sees into the person that is behind this man and inside this man. 
And there's another dimension to this, because the people at that time believed that if a person was blind, that meant that God was punishing them for something. And so they actually believed that if a person were born blind, that meant that they had committed a sin while they were still in the womb. You know, an infant committing a sin in the womb. I don't have any idea what kind of sin that would be, but I'm not a first century thinker either. And if it wasn't that infant in the womb, then it was at least his parents. And so since he was being punished by God, everyone who was sort of law-abiding would want to stay away from him. You stay clear of bad people because they make you bad. Don't you know that? I mean, that's how they believed it was, would be. And not only that, if God is punishing them, then they certainly don't want to interfere in whatever God is doing. <coughs> the fact that Jesus sees him is powerful. Because when Jesus sees him, he doesn't see him as a person to be avoided. He doesn't see him as someone who has no work. He doesn't see him as an unholy sufferer. He doesn't see any of that stuff. What Jesus sees in this man is someone that God loves. Years ago, there was an artist, and he was working in his studio, and he looked out the window, and he saw a beggar across the street just sitting there with his can out. And he looked at that beggar. The beggar was all sort of stooped over, looking down, eyes looking dejected. And he thought to himself, he would make a perfect thing to do as a portrait study. And so he began to paint. The be beggar didn't know he was being painted. He was just sitting there on the street corner, and the artist was painting away as a study. And when he was finished, he walked across the street carrying the por portrait, and he showed it to the beggar. Only he had painted it a little bit differently. He painted it with big, lifted-up square shoulders, with a head raised up and eyes bright and shining, almost even handsome. He showed the painting to the beggar, and the beggar said, Who is that? He looked familiar, but yet, on the other hand, just not quite right somehow. He said, is that me? That's not how I look. And the artist said, no, but it's how I see the person inside you. That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is not only seeing this blind man for a person who is loved by God, but he is also seeing the person that God intended him to be. And so it is with all of us. When God looks at you, God sees not only a person who is dear and beloved of God, but God also sees what is intended for you to be, to become the wholeness of what your life should be. And then Jesus not only sees the man, but he acts on this idea by healing him. You know, that's very powerful because it means for us that God's agenda is wholeness. God is always at work bringing wholeness to a broken humanity. That's why Jesus goes around in healing, because wherever God is present, healing happens, wholeness happens. It's part of what God is doing as God's work. Jesus does this in two ways. First of all, he says it. He says, no, it is neither you nor your parents that sinned. And then he acts on it by healing him. This powerful gift comes to him because as Jesus heals him, it is proof that God is not punishing him. This hardship that he's enduring is not God's punishment. Instead, it is a place, another place, in which the glory of God can be revealed. For God's work is to bring wholeness. It applies to our lives as well. If you're going through something hard, you no longer have to ask the question, is God punishing me for something? You can let go of that question entirely because that's not what's going on there. God is always at work for wholeness. And the truth is, if you hang on to the faith, even in hard times, you will end up not only being ultimately healed, but you will be a powerful witness to the glory of God. So in many ways, that's an awful lot to learn from this text, very powerful amount to learn. I mean, if we could all own and recognize that God loves us, sees us as we are and loves us anyway, and also sees us for what we can be and loves us into that, 
and that God's work is always to bring wholeness and healing and the ultimate form of that wholeness and healing is salvation. If we could get that, that would be transformative and maybe we could stop there. But I wonder if you noticed how long and detailed this reading is. It invites us to look more deeply because there's even more that God is doing in this text. The first thing that we need to see in this is just the simple fact that all throughout the Old Testament, it was said that the Messiah would be able to heal blindness. This is simply, very powerfully, a way of saying Jesus is the promised Messiah of God because he can heal blindness. Secondly, because in Jewish thought, there is no difference between physical and spiritual matters this man represents every kind of spiritual and physical blindness you could name. It's all types of blindness and all people who have blindness. And that means that the healing process is happening for everyone who will just open their hearts and let it happen. And be the witness of the Pharisees in this text is that sometimes spiritual blindness is harder to heal than physical blindness. I mean, just think of people who are hard-hearted and harsh towards others. It's much more difficult for a message of grace to touch their lives than it is to those who are open to that. Oftentimes, that kind of blindness is even more difficult. Third, it's very powerful to look at this text because it says absolutely and very clearly that simply keeping the law on its own in and of itself will not bring you into salvation. In fact, Jesus does this in a really poignant kind of a way because he does this healing by breaking the law. You might remember that this healing occurs on a Sabbath. According to Jewish law, there were 39 expressly forbidden things on the Sabbath. <coughs> One of those things was kneading, like kneading bread. If you read this text in the Greek, what it actually says there is Jesus spit on the ground and kneaded the mud into a poultice. In other words, he is deliberately in your face coming up against the law in this case in order to bring healing. It reveals to us that healing is more important to God than keeping the law perfectly. And more than that, it reveals to us that keeping the law in and of itself is not the direction in which salvation happens. What brought this man his vision back was being in relationship with Jesus. And you should notice that he didn't even know who Jesus was. When he was before he was healed, he didn't get to see Jesus. He comes back. He doesn't recognize Jesus because he was blind when he first came to Jesus. Now he gets revealed. In other words, it is God's action which initiates a relationship that brings salvation into our midst. That's incredibly powerful good news because it means for us that while we respond by living in a certain way that is good and godly, we do it as response to the blessing and gift of salvation that has been already offered, which salvation, by the way, is the ultimate healing that comes to a broken humanity. And so it is that we have powerful insights but I think one of the most fun of all the insights that we can get from this is to recognize that there are a variety of ways to respond to what God is doing. God is at work in the world. God is bringing healing and hope and the promise of salvation. And yet people respond in a different way. We see this in the response to the healing of the blind man. I mean, really, shouldn't everyone have just been elated for him that he got his sight back? Come on, I mean, surely we should all be related, but that's not what happened, was it? The Pharisees and the neighbors doubted it. They ignored him. They chided him. And when none of those things worked, they began to say it must be some other God that did it. Isn't that interesting? Don't we see this in the world around us? We don't always want the best for other people. We sometimes ignore the things that God is doing. And when we can't make peace with it and make it fit into our construct for something, we often think it must be someone else who has done this besides God. Then there's the parents who respond by denying what they, what they know to be true. 
because they are afraid. How many of you have failed to speak a word about Jesus because you were afraid what might happen to you? It's all around us. It's normal part of the responses that can happen to the gifts and blessings of God. But there is one appropriate response, and that's the response of the blind man. I hope you noticed what he did. First of all, he stands up for Jesus, and he speaks against the misinformation of the Pharisees. Now understand that's going to cost him something. We don't know if he would have been allowed in the synagogue as a blind man anyway, but we know for sure from that point forward he is not going to be allowed into the synagogue. They had already decided anyone that was on Jesus' side was going to be kicked out of the synagogue. So he is speaking for Jesus and speaking against the misinformation of the Pharisees, even knowing that it's going to cost him something. Sometimes faith costs us something. Sometimes we have to speak in ways that the rest of the world doesn't necessarily like. But by far and away, the most important thing that he does is he does not claim to know what he doesn't know, he says, I don't know whether the man was a sinner, but he does freely and openly claim what he does know, but I know he healed me. That's how you should witness. You are not expected to answer every question about God that comes along. You do not have to be an authority on every chapter in the Bible. You don't have to know every single thing about God. All you have to know is about your relationship and be willing to express it when someone asks. That's what God is calling you to do. So whatever's happening in your life, whatever sort of spiritual blindness is creating a difficulty for you, you can have these responses as well. You can be like the Pharisees and deny it and chide it and pretend it doesn't really matter and act as if something else is going on. You can be like the parents and deny it because you are afraid. Or you can be like the man who was blind and be a believer. And that means if you believe, whatever kind of healing comes your way, at least you will always know that waiting for you is the main healing that God desires to give, the principal gift of healing that God brings to a broken world, and that is salvation. Let it be so among us.